Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's always difficult to be the first sessions after lunch, and uh, hopefully I can, we can all sort of work hard to keep you awake. Um, today, our topic is about shaping fintech for the new normal. Um, if you talk about the pandemic, which we started off in, 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 in early today, and uh, we always compare the current COVID-19 with the SARS back in 2003. Uh, the reason why I want to raise it is because back in 2003, the SARS comes in and go away very quickly, right? Uh, the mortality rate is generally small, uh, uh, percentage-wise is um, low, um, but then the mortality is, is quite a lot of people. But compared to COVID, it turns out to be quite a long time, right? It's about two years now, almost two years now. And then, although the mortality rate percentage is low, but I think the total number of deaths is worldwide is very high. The reason why we raise it, I, I remember back in the COVID, uh, back in the, the SARS in 2003, I was probably the get the last flight from Beijing to Hong Kong, uh, because after that, it was all closed. And then, so the then following two months, I was actually sitting in the office doing nothing. I was an accountant, because I can't do anything without seeing my clients. And when the COVID started, the first thing I did, I actually talked to the stock exchange and see if there's any flexibility for our fellow accountants and, 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 and those listed companies to report their, their result, because it's a very tight timetable. They need to do it in three months. So if you can't go to see the clients and do the auditing, you just can't do it. And they actually study about it, and they give some relaxation, but turns out it's only a very small percentage of the company cannot report on time. My point is the technology actually helps. And if, if that, the COVID happened in 2003, I don't know how we could survive, not just the accounting, but the business in general, without the technology, how can we survive at that time? So I think it's a sort of blessing in disguise. Uh, and one thing when, when it started COVID uh, back in uh, uh, 2020, uh, I think insurance authority under Clemens worked very hard with the participants, the insurance company, the agents, to see how we could help them to continue to do start, start business. Uh, and you know what, we come up with a sort of virtual onboarding process. So at least, although we cannot see the clients in person, but we still, through a little mobile phones, okay, can actually connect with the clients, and then the business still continue. So I think really it's the push and pull factor of the technology, the fintech, which helps us to change the way that we do business. So I think this topic, shaping fintech for the new normal, is really an important area is that in the future, I think there will be a lot of changes. So without further ado, maybe I, I turn to my very experienced panelists. Uh, excuse me, I didn't have time to, to introduce each and every one of you and, and for all the sort of uh, uh, participants, you can see their CVs from the um, uh, website. They are very sort of experienced and uh, knowledge people. And let me turn to the panelists for first question is the, the pandemic has led to changes in customer behavior. So do you believe that the pandemic has increased the willingness of customers to embrace digital or prefer online? Uh, have any of your panelists think that you have changed your business strategies because of that? So may I start with Angel first? Sure, sure. thank you, Stephen. Um, First of all, you know, you, you talked about, you know, a lot of uh, changes, you know, compared back to uh, 2003. One of the change that I will highlight is that, you know, if we have a panel in 2003, all of us will be bringing uh, a pile of paper, you know, coming onto the panel. But look at today, you have an iPad, you know, Mr. Zhang has, uh, has still a paper. <laughs> <laughs> But then, you know, I have a mobile phone. Honestly, you know, we are not going to look at our mobile phone or iPad or paper. Uh, but, you know, to me, having a mobile phone just nearby, you know, is a sense of uh, comfort. It's a, it's a safety net, you know. It's, it's looking like, you know, if I have anything happen to me, I can go to my mobile phone for rescue. Um, 
I think that talks a lot about the uh, digital adoption, um, how quickly you know, that people are feeling comfortable you know, with all these devices and with digital solution over the course of the last 10 years. Um, COVID definitely accelerate that, but I don't think COVID started the digital transformation. I think it started well be before you know, COVID starts. Um, COVID accelerate because the environment call for it, uh, call for the need of it, right? And, and you talked about uh, uh, some examples beforehand. Um, if you look at the usual new product life cycle adoption, usually you will have a group of early adopter, and then you will have a group of follower, and then you have a group of lagger. Um, I think digital adoption is the same before COVID, but during COVID, all the follower will be more willing and proactively exploring more the usage of digital, and all the laggers are catching up. So that's the acceleration that we are seeing, and it is across demographics. So I have an 84 years old mother, you know, who is now very fluent in using her mobile phone to call a taxi. Okay, um, and also, you know, whenever needed, you know, she can actually use her iPad to call food delivery, uh, which is unheard of, okay, before COVID. So it is across demographics that the digital adoption is going very quickly. And it is very uh, prevalent in our business-related uh, uh, metrics as well. So I can share with you, you know, I, I'm working in the banking industry. So very prevalent, you know, when I look into the credit card usage. Uh, right now, almost 45, over 45% of the credit card sales are online purchase. Uh, before COVID, the number is like 20 or below 20%. Um, another you know, very prevalent metrics is the digital adoption of our retail uh, customers. So right now, you know, our retail customer digital adoption is up to 85%. So 85 out of 100 customers are using our either desktop internet banking or mobile banking you know, for the th uh, past 30 days, at least once. So it, it is actually quite um, clear you know, that the customer adoption is there and is growing very fast. And you asked the questions about uh, whether that changed our business strategy as well as uh, business model. And I can uh, share with you one example. Um, Citibank is always quite um, innovative. So we are actually the first bank you know, in the market who used direct sales force to sell Citibank credit card. <laughs> Um, and direct sales force means, you know, you have uh, physical bodies, salespeople, uh, standing, you know, in the uh, shopping mall or even on the street, putting up booths, you know, to sell you a credit card. Uh, and we have been adopting this particular business model for many years, and we, are, we were the first one in the market to adopt this model. Um, 2021 January, you know, this year, early this year, we have uh, officially disseminated the whole direct sales force you know, in our business uh, because you know, we actually look at the channel, okay, uh, channel for acquisition. Before COVID, um, the digital channel only contribute about 30% of our credit card onboarding uh, new credit card. And then you know, the other 70% is mandated channel. And that's why we have to be very uh, reliant you know, on either our branch or our direct sales team. Post COVID, it is the other way around is 70% digital channel uh, onboarding and 30% mandate channel. So yes, you know, it actually changed our business strategy as well as our business model. And I think you know, we, we, we will have a sentimental kind of attachment you know, to, the, to the, a particular business model like the direct sales model because we were the first one to launch it. But then as the macro environments changes, as the consumer's preference changes, I do think that you know, business like ourselves has to adopt uh, and change you know, uh, how we do business with our clients. Thank you. Interesting to hear the, this change uh, uh, in the sort of, uh, uh, business practices. So, so looking forward to understand more about what, what other changes that you anticipate in the future. Maybe I, I sort of pass on to Colin to give us some feedback first. Thank you very much. Well, I certainly would echo what Angel has just mentioned about 
uh, pandemic accelerating the pace of the digitalization. A few years back, we are talking about we, we need to get ourselves ready. But I think right now, uh, it is happening. We are actually in the middle of it. So it's not really a matter of about getting ready for it. Uh, adopting technology is like the baseline by now. Well, um, I think uh, for the HKMA, uh, unlike the entity I think represented by the fellow speakers here, uh, we are a public domain organization primarily responsible for financial market stability, market development. Uh, we are not certainly not about you know, um, creating or implementing products to interface with the customers. Our focus is more on you know, enabling, uh, facilitating, and promoting financial institutions to innovate and adopt new technologies. So um, on, on that part, actually, um, all along, the HMA has been quite alert to the fintech trend. Uh, in the light of this, you know, accelerated, you know, pace of digitalization, we 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 do kind of, you know, uh, also uh, try to keep pace with market development. Uh, back in 2016, we, uh, for example, established the fintech facilitation office. Uh, we started looking at the uh, CBDC. At the time, uh, we also uh, uh, start looking at the uh, virtual banking regime, and so we are the first one in the region to introduce the virtual banking system. Uh, in the light of this uh, accelerated you know, trend of you know, uh, uh, fintech adoption, uh, early this year in June, we actually un unveiled our new package of initiatives called Fintech 2025 to hope to you know, uh, help the industry to cope with this new development and I think later on, uh, we will have uh, more time to talk about that, you know, the individual initiatives under that, that package. Okay, thank you, Colin. I, I think we all agree that uh, MA has done a lot of things. And uh, one thing which I think everyone will benefit immediately is the FPS. Uh, and uh, I must say it's, it's very convenient that we could sort of, sort of uh, uh, move money around paying our friends or whatever. So I think it's a, it's a great thing to see. So, so looking forward for more sort of uh, initiative from the MA. So may I move to the private practice from the uh, Chi Pao from the Go, uh, Gobi business, uh, Gobi partners uh, to give us some views. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, I, obviously the, the sentiments as um, Angel and, and Colin just described in terms of the acceleration of, of digital uh, and technology, um, all of that, you know, I, I, I'm a true believer in. I mean, I've been investing in that for like the uh, last five, ten years. Um, you know, I, I think what the impact that COVID has had um, on this space is that, you know, it's no longer about willingness to change, right? Because when the pandemic came, it, at the height of the pandemic, everything was closed. Right? There was no offline presence. Like, there were no branch offices. There were no offline sales reps. Um, and so for consumers to continue to go about their day-to-day -day lives, um, for them to continue to do business in the way that they need to, uh, they had to turn to online. Um, and so it was less about the willingness. And I think you know, even your 84-year-old mother may, may, may agree. Um, you know, she, if she wanted food, I mean, she had to go to Deliveroo or Food Panda. Um, so, so I think... You know, with technology, um, you know, providing an alternative um, and an easier way for people to live and to work, um, you know, I, I think that that has become more clear than ever. Um, for, for my business, I'm in venture capital. So, you know, we invest in early stage technology startups. Um, and obviously, thanks so much to MA and all the regulators uh, here in Hong Kong. Um, you know, there, there's been a very, you know, big wave of innovators and entrepreneurs and you know we, we've obviously been able to capitalize on a lot of those companies uh, a number of them sitting here in this room today um, you know with, with the virtual banking license I mean that that's created a new uh, wave of companies um, that you know not only work with traditional uh, banking partners but you know some also uh, new players that come into the landscape um, you know I, I think that there's there's so much to be done um, and you know I think uh, going uh, on further into this panel, I mean, we'll, we'll be talking about other opportunities and such. Um, but I, I, I would just like to, you know, say that technology is definitely here to stay, um, and we're all here to support it. Thank you. How about John? Well, uh, you, you mentioned pandemic. Uh, I think 
for, for most people, uh, health comes to mind. But for a virtual insurance company like Bowtie, we think about protection, we think about prevention, uh, which are quite, quite important. I hope we have a little bit more time later on to talk a bit more about that. And the technology we, we talked about that, that we are using now actually has been around for a long time. But what happens is that the pandemic is forcing the consumers to, to, to migrate to the digital mode. And in some ways, we are accelerating the adoption of, 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 the, of the technology. So the adults are working from home, uh, they're shopping online, and, and the kids are doing remote learning and so forth. Uh, these are really amazing developments, uh, but especially for both types, because the greater usage of the internet is perfect for virtual insurance firm like us. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, a lot of the, the traditional insurance agents uh, are working from home uh, because they, they, they need to do that and, and beginning to embrace the digital channels and supporting the, the remote applications. It actually takes a long time for these old ways to change. Uh, but uh, I'm quite sure that the traditional business model in a post-COVID world will not be the same again. Uh, and, and but and customer behavior adopted during this period uh, can be sticky too. And digital application uh, that we are using now will continue in some form and most likely in a blended mixed mode of, of, of some kind. Uh, and well, what we can say is that the current trends do favor insure tech, uh, a lot of that, and many investors are expecting a disruption in the insurance market. And I personally, I'm, I'm optimistic that the future of virtual insurance is, is quite promising. Okay, um, if you don't mind, John, I'll just stay with, uh, uh, with you. Uh, because I still remember uh, when Bowtie sort of came to insurance authority uh, to seek for approval. I think we, with the, the board itself, had a meeting and looked through your sort of uh, strategies, uh, vision, et cetera, et cetera, which is quite convincing. And, and I have a question, maybe you could tell us about the whole strategy of using FinTech to, to build a better insurance ecosystem, and how in particular you think that actually the COVID is helping you to see, speed up the process or actually uh, not as favorable as you would expect. So I just wanted to get your view on, on how mm -hmm. these things pans out uh, during the establishment of, of Bowtie. Uh, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, InsureTech actually has uh, brought about positive disruption to the industry. What we see now is that the, the industry is targeting a new customer segment through the use of the virtual insurance, uh, through some on online uh, channels. And we are also onboarding a lot of new technical and startup talents as well, uh, who would not have been interested in the traditional insurance business. And we're also bringing new business models to, uh, to, to the whole insurance in industry. And you know, as insure tech and digital innovations continue to develop and so forth. But for, in, for traditional insurers, that we are not really uh, direct competition with them. Uh, insure tech can be a, a, huge, a great partner for for the traditional industry to, to drive the adoption of digital technology across the value chain and also to test new uh, business propositions. Uh, what we have done at Bowtie is that we have built a convenient platform for consumers to buy pure health protection products like VHIS, critical illness, life, and so forth at an affordable price. And, and that, that's a very important aspect. Uh, and because you know, we, we do see uh, from, from, from the report uh, provided by uh, IA is that whole the MPG, the mortality protection gap in Hong Kong is, is quite huge compared to, to, the, to, uh, to the other uh, jurisdictions uh, with about $6.9 trillion in total, which translate to close to $2 million per working adult. And our insurance platform also serves to empower consumers to, to decide for themselves when, where, what, how, with whom to buy insurance. So they have a lot of choice and that's empowerment for the customers and technology meanwhile helps to bring down costs of, uh, of insurance and making it more affordable 
and thereby improving uh, financial inclusiveness in a very practical sense. Th thank you, thank you, John. And, and maybe I come back to Andrew, because um, uh, I think s we all know City is a very diversified uh, group, although it's focusing on bank, but still a lot of other financial products. Uh, banking assurance is, is clearly one of the things that you guys started. And um, so I just want to you, for you to share with us uh, how the banks and insurance players, bank insurance actually so leverage the fintech to create synergy and, and develop and enhance value propositions to customers. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm blessed to have uh, uh, several very uh, long time partner uh, from the insurance industry um, to come by and, uh, and discuss as well as develop you know, the digital proposition in the insurance distribution uh, business. Um, so I still remember that you know, when we first uh, partner um, with AIA uh, to distribute uh, insurance product, the first things that we look into is how to use technology and digital solution to enhance client experience. Um, so just to give you an example, uh, when we are in the paper stage, okay, paper age, uh, in order to sell or complete a sales of a life insurance product in the banking environment, and thanks to our primary regulators, we do have a lot of regulations to follow, rightly, um, we actually have to propose like a 30 pages of application and proposal to the clients. Um, and then, you know, the sales has to flip, you know, all the 30 pages, explain line by line to our clients. And guess what? How many signature that the clients has to sign on that 30 pages before he or she can complete the application? Take a guess. Not 30. <laughs> 18. One eight, okay? I personally count <laughs> the number of signature that the clients has to sit there and sign on each and every page of paper. So our partner AIA and ourselves sit together and said, this is a very lousy client experience. Although all the things that in the 30 pages and in the 18 signature has to be done, okay, because we need to ascertain the affordability, the suitability of the customer. Um, However, you know, we, we, we do not give up. <laughs> we go on and ask ourselves, you know, whether technology can help, you know, whether digital solution can help. So we actually do a total revamp, you know, of the process by using technology. We open API so that because those are our existing banking customers. So many of the demographic information, a lot of the income information is already in our system. So if by open API, we can actually pre-populate, you know, some of the information to the uh, application form, which we have digitized. Um, and then, you know, for all the risk and control, you know, in order to comply to the regulation, uh, we actually build in, you know, to the, you call it calculator or you call it a digital uh, platform, where the customer, when they declare something, you know, self-calculation happened, you know, in the in the application form so as to make sure that we abide to the regulations. So all in all, the whole client experience improved a lot. Instead of the 30 pages, um, it is all in the digital form. Instead of signing 18 times, the customer only signed not one, two times. <laughs> um, so I think you know, this is one of the very uh, initial experience that we have. And obviously, that on not only help clients to have a better experience, but also our salespeople uh, to be much more vigilant you know, in following uh, the requirement, uh, more helpful for them you know, to be able to explain to the clients step by step in a much more smoother way. And also for the clients to have an emergency exit as well, because when they are doing you know, it digitally, you, we actually have a person, you know, to assist um, the clients to do that. So there is an emergency exit that, you know, if the clients doesn't know how to do it, you know, there is still a person to help them. So this is, I think, you know, one of the uh, very big dedication, you know, we have in the bank assurance business that we do want to digitize day one. I think, Andrew, the good thing nowadays is that I was repetitively told if I have a bank account, 
I should never close it because I, I, I cannot reopen it again for, because of all the currents of uh, anti-money laundering rules. So, so that's why the banks have always have customers. And then you can sort of start selling other things to their customers. So it's a good business to be in as a bank. Maybe for the regulators, the XGMA. And uh, may, may I ask, because you, you, Colin, you talk about the um, strategy 2025, right? Um, can, can you tell us more about uh, how we could create more uh, uh, cross collaborations between the banking, insurance, and, and other sort of uh, financial services? Well, before going into that, I, I think you should be quite easily open a bank account nowadays. Uh, <laughs> uh, try, try one of the virtual banks. <laughs> it's actually only take uh, five minutes. <laughs> uh, go to the mobile phone and then five minutes yes. you can open a bank account. Well, um, on, on, on our strategy, I think, um, I, I mentioned earlier on, I think adopting technology is a baseline. And, uh, and I think that's for, for individual institutions. For the financial, financial market as a whole, I think the baseline is really on collaboration. Because I think a, a key characteristic of this moment, movement is that it is a, an ecosystem thing. Uh, it involves all the parties along the production chain, and that cannot be tackled through a sectoral approach. And sometimes that may even go across the border. I think uh, audience might have heard about our you know, FinTech 2025 strategy. It contains um, a wide range of initiatives. But in this, I think what we want to achieve is, uh, on one hand, we hope to create the demand, to promote the demand. On the other hand, we try to help the financial institution uh, to equip them with the you know, productive resources to meet all those demands, which we classify those factors into data and ecosystem. For some of these you know, uh, demand and supply factors, we do have a better control. For example, we uh, have set out our you know, uh, red table map to provide guidance uh, to work hand in hand with the industry on how they can better apply technology to you know, compliance regulatory issues, just uh, as Andrew just mentioned, no need to fill in you know, like 30 pages or 40 pages. You may use it, switch to a digital mode to do it. On the other hand, uh, we are conscious that we can take a more active role in uh, product providing you know, supportive factors like financial infrastructures. That's the reason why we, uh, we're working on the commercial data interchange, uh, data exchange platform. Uh, we also work with other central banks on cross-border CBDC platform. And I think as you have uh, mentioned early on, the FPS is, is one of such type of you know, financial infrastructures. But that's just one part of it. For many other areas, we do need to collaborate with the other stakeholders. Uh, take the you know, CDI as an example. Yes, we are building a data highway to connect you know, financial institutes and the data providers. But um, we also need to engage you know, the data providers quite intensively to bring them up to speed, technically and, and commercially. That's the reason why we have been engaging with a lot of uh, data providers like telcos, uh, e-commerce platform, trade declaration you know, agencies. Okay? We are actually doing technical POC with them. Uh, on the other hand, even on the you know, data consumer, uh, cons consumer part, like banks, some of them may actually require better support. For example, in data analytics, uh, in credit assessment. So we also need to bring in those you know, service providers. So that's the reason why um, it, it, it's not only uh, ourselves as regulatory agency that we can do it. And you, if you take a, even a higher view, uh, more macro view on it, other players will come into the pictures. For example, I think uh, a starting point of any customized digital financial service is digital identity. And on this one, fortunately, the government you know, introduced I'm Smart last year. And uh, right now, we are starting to see adoption of banks using I'm Smart, for example, on remote onboarding. But well, how about corporate ID? So um, we actually need to work with different stakeholders in order to arrive at the, you know, uh, uh, an optimal outcome in terms of you know, a rise back you know, digital uh, uh, fintech adoption. Uh, coming back to the collaboration, for example, with the insurance sector, I think uh, we have been collaborating. 
uh, our you know uh, recreation sandbox have been linked up already. And I also recall that uh, last year, actually, the several uh, recreation agencies, we actually joined force to support the launch of the I'm Smart. Uh, as I sincerely hope that we can continue to collaborate so that we can, you know, as a whole, promote the formation of a critical mass of, you know, adopters in this market. And that in turn will have a pulling effect to make more things, you know, more adoption happening in Hong Kong. Um, uh, Colin, I think um, if you talk about the critical mass, I think surely you should count the insurance authority as one of your partners. Uh, we hear from, from you about the 2025 strategies. Uh, we love to have 2025 strategies, right, Clement, on the insurance, but we don't have the money to do that. <laughs> so I guess we probably have to tag along with the MA uh, uh, FinTech strategies and, and see what we can do uh, on that part to, to help our sort of, uh, uh, industries. Um, may I just move on to Chi Bao, right? Um, you are a very successful investors, uh, venture capitalists uh, on, on the FinTech. And you, you now you know that in the world we talk about unicorns. All these unicorns are basically tech. Okay, uh, majority of them, uh, fintech, gambling, whatsoever, and and if I focus on the fintech aspect of it, based on your experience, your investments, so which part you would think there will be the hottest elements coming forward in the next couple of years, uh, which will be very successful in the markets. Um, th th thanks for that question. Um, I, I think. You know, I, I, I participate in a lot of investment-related forums. Uh, this is actually one of, one of the uh, few industry forums that, that I'm a part of. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually, um, I, I'm really grateful to Angel uh, for sharing her digital transformation story um, in such detail. Because I, I think that it's, it needs to be understood that technology can and should be thought about in that level of detail. Right? It, it can and should be integrated uh, and implemented in all forms, in all aspects of the business, uh, in all parts of the value chain. Um, as an investor, as I look out uh, at the various startups and what they're doing, um, you know, I, I think I would break it down into three main layers. Right? Um, I think at the application layer, there's digital products, there's digital channels, um, there's new ways that you know, these companies are using technology uh, to design new things that are not in the market yet or are more competitive than what is already in the market. Um, at the, the second layer would be the platform layer. Um, a lot of these are the, are the uh, companies that leverage upon uh, the licenses and, and, and the regulatory uh, changes that you know, uh, the environment offers, right? So whether that is like the virtual banks here or the virtual insurers, um, I, I think that those are all platform level opportunities that you know, introduce innovation at you know, a broader scale. Um, and even for, for, an, and for an investor like myself, I even go down one further layer uh, into you know, the baser, uh, deep, deeper technology levels, right? Um, the AI, uh, voice recognition, right? machine learning. These are, these are all uh, very deep technology sectors that you know, can and are applied to uh, FinTech applications. Right. Um, I, I think, you know, just just one. I mean, I, I'm, I've invested in all all of those layers uh, and even here in Hong Kong. Um, I, I think just one one company that I, I do want to kind of uh, highlight uh, is a company called Fano Labs. Uh, so that company is a, a voice recognition company. Um, what they do is they do natural language processing to uh, analyze uh, voice recordings, conversations, uh, things like this. And so. Uh, as you guys may know, I mean, uh, there's insurance companies, commercial banks, they have so many customer calls, right? Um, and obviously the regulators all need to be very aware uh, that, you know, no laws or, you know, all the compliance, you know, everything is, is all right. Um, but in the past, how have, how have the regulators been able to do that? They, they've sent people in to listen to tapes, hours and hours of tapes. Right? I mean, imagine how many human hours you know, that, 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 caught, like, that, that would take and you know, how the associated costs would be. Um, so if you're able to use technology then to go in, um, natural language process, um, and analyze those conversations and then be able to pick out uh, automatically uh, using a robot, 
basically. Um, you know, the conversations that are of interest, I mean, that actually saves so much cost and actually saves banks and a lot of institutions, um, you know, millions of dollars in fines every year. <laughs> um, and so, you know, th those are aspects where, you know, as an everyday consumer, you may not think about, right? Th those are applications of technologies and in areas where, you know, we, we do not come across. But, you know, all of the companies that, that we see in this space, they're, they're all targeting um, opportunities and, and problems that, that should be solved uh, and can be solved with technology. Um, and so, you know, wh whether that is uh, in what I just said in like the voice recognition AI space, whether that's in uh, the virtual banking space, whether that's in, you know, uh, insure tech companies, cross-border payments, consumer lending, buy now, pay later, everything, uh, all that's very hot. Um, you know, all of that excites me. Um, and, I, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it's becoming easier and easier uh, for these startups to build their businesses here in Hong Kong. And, and I think that's very heartening. Okay, um, thank you. So maybe we sort of now go to the polling. I think we have the polling questions. Right. Um, the polling questions uh, is, what would be the most significant role of fintech in expediting financial connectivity in the Greater Bay Area. Uh, there are four options. A, being a powerhouse of innovation for financial services. B, fostering collaboration among skilled professionals. C, serving as an effect effective information exchange highway. D, improving the mobility of people and capital. Okay, so we have 20 seconds to start. Maybe after the quick survey, I'll probably ask each and every one of you your choice as well before I open up the result. So you pick your choice. Okay, time's up. So before I release the result, maybe I repeat the questions to you again and, and, and ask for your opinion and also the reason. Uh, the question was, what would, be the, what would be the most significant role of fintech in expediting financial connectivity in the greater Bay, Bay Area? A, being a powerhouse of innovation for financial services. B, fostering collaboration among skilled professionals. C, serving as an effective information exchange highway. And D, improving the mobility of people and capital. So anyone want yourself? Your choice. John? Well, I would take all of the above. <laughs> because you can't. <laughs> because they, they can. are, because they are all, all, all really important. Uh, but, but I think having said that, uh, you know, even even though that technology has sort of accelerated uh, a, a, a lot of our the, the, the business model, the, the way that we operate and so forth, I think we still have to place a lot of faith in, in human beings, and I think that that is still going to be a, a very very important thing. Uh, I mean, other than attack, you know, getting into these four different points, I would want to raise one point is that I think with technology, we can move more and more into sort of uh, uh, to more, more focus on the individual. Uh, for, for example, uh, in, in, with, the, the, with the younger generation now, uh, many of them are slashes. They don't take on permanent jobs. Uh, they, they may m move from one job to another v very quickly and so forth. So I think re regulators, uh, you know, uh, MA or IA and so forth, need to start thinking about how we can protect these people. I mean, they, they may not need to rely solely on the company uh, getting insurance for them, for example. Uh, maybe the insurance should be carried by the individual uh, with, with 
contributions by the various companies at different sorts. Because as you can see, most part-time people don't get insurance at all. So how do they protect themselves? So that's why we're going back to putting more faith in the human being, looking more about at the protection, looking more at prevention for, for all of that. So people is still more important than technology. I always, I mean, <laughs> I think that that is always the thing. I, mean, I, I think we, we would be neglecting our well-being if we placing technology over our own well-being. Yes, agree. So, Shifo? I, I would totally pick everything as well. <laughs> <laughs> they really need to have that option in there. Um, but I, I think if, if put a gun to my head, I, I, would, I would pick A, um, the innovation powerhouse. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, I totally agree with John. Uh, people are, are definitely what um, change the world and, and what make the impact. Um, but I, I think you need something uh, to draw the people in. I, I think you need uh, a calling card. You need a banner. You need uh, something where people can rally to. And I, I think that that's something um, that is a positioning or it's a, you know, it's a belief um, that Hong Kong can be that innovation powerhouse within the GBA. Um, and so I, I, I would pick A. Thank you. Colin? Well, I, I think, again, I would side with John. If I can choose, <laughs> I would pick all of them. Um, because uh, I think it, it appears to me those are not you know, mutually exclusive. And if you, you can seize the opportunity and do it right, you probably can achieve all those effects. But I think the key is um, uh, how we can best leverage our competitive advantage in each of those areas. Well, uh, for FinTech, it is a combination of Fin and Ted. And I think uh, for us here in Hong Kong, we possess very strong financial market expertise, uh, international standard, uh, uh, you know, uh, standing arrangement in the international arena. We also have well established platform here. So I think we, we do have a very strong competitive advantage in you know, riding on the existing platform, riding to, on our knowledge base to add value uh, in our expansion in the GBA areas. So again, so I think all four areas are important. I think we need to recognize our own competitive advantage and try to maximize our you know, advantage in helping ourselves to you know, expand in the GBA. Uh, and you? Yeah, my choice is number three, okay. uh, information exchange, uh, but not exactly three, because I think it should be information and data exchange. Um, and, and in my mind, I think technology can be built everywhere. And you know, either is you know this fintech or this that fintech. You know, they, they may come up with you know different technology and solutions. But I think one of the very important things when we talked about developing into GBA and capturing the opportunity in GBA, and we all need to recognize that we are working in two different system: regulatory system, um, uh, a political system, and you know the people are different. You know, the behavior is different. So I think, you know, in order for us to uh, do business effectively, you know, in the GBA area, we need to have um, to resolve for information and data exchange in a comfortable way. So people will concern about privacy, uh, will concern about cross-border data uh, uh, privacy. So I, I do think, you know, if FinTech can help to resolve uh, those issues using technology, uh, that will highly encourage and help, you know, the business to develop uh, business and capture opportunity in the GBA. Okay, thank you. Uh, and first of all, there's no right or wrong answer to start. I think it's, it's a, a good fit for thoughts and to see how, how we think on this particular area. Uh, but actually, I need to turn back into the survey result. Uh, for the on-site one, on-site, uh, A is 50%, B is 15.15, C is 12%, and D uh, is 24. And then for those online, it's actually very similar. I mean, it's quite surprising. I mean, we have, uh, this is the th third uh, uh, survey, and um, both on-site and online are more or less the same. So for the online, is A is 49, B is 9%, C is 21, and D is 22. Okay, so thank you. I think going back to people, hopefully we don't need a uh, robot in, as our panelists in the future. <laughs> right, um, can I turn to the fi probably the final questions for, for you guys? And um, if, if you had to one word to describe FinTech in the 
pre-pandemic world and now the world to describe fintech in the post-pandemic new normal. Uh, what would those words be? Ladies first. Um, pre-pandemic, I will say a hybrid car. Post-pandemic will be a total EV car. So basically, maybe, you know, pre-pandemic, you know, is a trial and test and a little bit of hybrid online, offline kind of uh, 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 experimental. But post-pandemic, I think because of the adoption is growing so fast, you know, uh, everybody is go all in. Good, thank you. Colin? Well, I think uh, pre-pandemic, I think FinTech will provide you with an edge so that you, you'll be better positioned vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other players. But right now, uh, it, it becomes a baseline. It is essential for your survival. Sibo? Uh, uh, Pre-pandemic, pre post-pandemic. Yeah. Uh, fast and Furious. Well. Have also happens to be one of my favorite movies. But, um, I like that. <laughs> Pre-pandemic, fintech innovation, it was, it was coming, right? Uh, you know, adoption, growth, it was fast. Uh, Post-pandemic, it's coming with a vengeance now, right? I mean, it's out to get all the traditional players that are not on board. It's, um, you know, growth is through the roof, um, and, you know, everyone just has to hop on now. Thank you, John. Well, I, I would say that uh, uh, pre-pandemic is vision. vision. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to give my attribute to the leadership of IA, like yourself, Clement, Moses, and so forth, for, for, for breaching that traditional boundary of uh, a traditional industry and getting into uh, uh, the virtual insurance and also placing trust in a group of really young people with little track record. And I think that that's, that's quite amazing and that's, that's vision in a way. Uh, Post-pandemic, I would say opportunity. And I would go back to, to Bowtie and uh, I think we see huge opportunity for us to scale uh, as well as uh, give it us more room for expansion to the Greater Bay Area as well as Southeast Asia. Uh, I think that's our immediate future that we see. Right, great. I, I think you, you, you all give us a very good uh, sort of uh, uh, words to describe the two areas. And uh, personally, I'm, I'm an optimistic person. So uh, when I talk about the, the SARS, and I remember what happened back to 2003, uh, can't do anything because of SARS, but you all remember what happened in 2004 and five and six. The economy is just straight up, right? And, and hopefully after COVID, our economy goes straight up again. So, so thank you. So now I think we need to move to a Q&A, more interactive and um, questions for our people are in, in this room and, and also uh, for those who are online to give us any questions that they may have. Thank you. Okay. Now, before I get to one of those questions from the floors, I have a qu questions from our fellow uh, uh, regulator, uh, MPFA. You know, this conference is not just for the insurance people. <laughs> we have other sort of uh, finance services people as well. So um, today we heard from speakers the prospect of digital transformations and demand of the digital infrastructure. Uh, but we know that MPFA has been sort of doing a great investments and a big investments in the MPF platform. Uh, and uh, we would like to, to know from them how this important structure will change the whole market ecosystem. So I think Cynthia, you're here today. So may I have Cynthia and, and give us some sort of insight as to what you guys are doing. Cynthia is the executive director of MPFA in charge of the in EPF uh, MPFA platform initiative. Cynthia, thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Stephen, and thanks the audience for the interest in the EMPF platform. Um, I'll be delighted to give you a quick glimpse of what it is all about. Um, if I have to um, summarize it in a few words, in a nutshell, I would say it is a digital infrastructure which will enable digital transformation to take MPF scheme administration to a new and better normal. I think I will try to sum it up that way. Um, 
uh, first of all, maybe um, I'll tell you a, a little bit more about what the current situation is. The MDF market has 13 trustees, and they operate 12 completely different MPF scheme administration systems. And as you can see, it's very decentralized and fragmented. It's not conducive to building up economies of scale. And on the user side, we have four and a half million scheme members. And altogether, they have 10 million accounts. So you can imagine. Everyone has, on average, about two to three MPF accounts. And um, because of the fragmentation in the market, Imagine you try to imagine someone who tried to um, look at his or her own MPF savings holistically. There's no way you can do it. There's no one place where you can you can go to and take a look at how much your you have actually saved in your MPF system. And on the employer side, we have about 300,000 employers making contributions on a monthly basis to the MPF system, and that is a lot of transactions, a lot of work. And imagine some good employers who want to give um, choice to the employees of more than one scheme. Say, for example, if an employer wants to give three choices, three different schemes for the employees to choose from, what do they need to do? They have to triple the effort in making MPF contributions because there are 12 different systems in the, in the market. So what is EMPF? It is actually a common electronic platform which will replace the 12 different scheme administration system that is now in the market. It will actually facilitate both the employers and the employees in managing the MPF accounts and dealing with their MPF um, um, administration. So the benefit is not just user experience. We've talked about how it will make things simpler. It will actually be able to reduce costs because the introduction of the, com of the common platform will increase efficiency, which will lead to lower fees. And we have actually just passed the, um, the LegCo has actually passed the um, supporting um, uh, law, the law amendment in October, which will actually enable the operation of the EMPF platform. And also, it will require the trustees to pass on the savings to the scheme members. So how much, ex how much savings will we expect? In the first couple of years, we expect scheme administration fee to reduce by about 30%. And cumulatively over 10 years, we expect savings to reach the range of 30 to $40 billion. So it is actually a lot of money. So apart from savings, there will also be, the EMPF platform will also facilitate future reforms. For example, the government has already got two initiatives um, in the pipeline. Some of you might have heard about the government making contributions for low-income earners, and you might have also heard about destination, designated savings account for employers, which will help gradually reducing and removing offsetting. So these are very significant and um, important initiatives. And without the EMPF platform, I don't think they would be possible. So the MPF system has actually reached the um, 21st year, and it is about halfway through the life of a retirement system, which takes 40 years to mature. So it's time for us to do some major reforms, and the EMPF is one of them. So um, in terms of progress, I think some of you would be interested in knowing about the timing. Um, we are actually pressing ahead at full steam um, developing the platform at the moment, uh, following which there'll be a 24-month period um, during which the trustees and the schemes, they will onboard the platform one by one. And we expect full operation in the year 2025. Um, one last point I want to mention is that because of the significance of this EMPF platform, uh, it is actually featured in the government's Smart City Blueprint 2.0 which was released uh, a year ago in December last year. It will actually reach out to all the scheme members and the entire working population. That's the critical mass that Colin actually mentioned earlier. We've got it here. The critical mass that we need for people to actually digitalize and become uh, uh, more um, FinTech. So I think if we talk about COVID just now, we talk, talk about COVID. Um, 
maybe I, I can share one, per, one further piece of information with you. Angel talked about at City, the digitalization rate or the digital usage rate has gone from 30 to 70 percent. We have also witnessed an increase in digitalization rate because the trustees at the moment do offer certain electronic means for employers and employees to manage their accounts. The usage rate before COVID-19 was only about 20 to 30 percent. And today, it's 45, not as high as the 70% um, uh, the, the that Angel mentioned. Um, that's probably because we've got a lot of um, grassroots members in the, in the MPF industry. So um, every cloud has a silver lining. The pandemic has probably been, the, um, I would say, maybe uh, the blessing in disguise in terms of fintech development. So. I think, I hope this has given you a quick glimpse of what EMPFF is about, and I look forward to be able to share more with you in the months to come when we progress with this um, mega scale project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice to hear that uh, it's a good sort of progress and uh, good luck for, for your systems. Uh, and maybe I think we still have a few minutes, maybe sort of take one of the um, questions from the floor. And, um, questions for all the panelists. Um, I think particularly when, when John mentioned about the people aspect. So I think the question is talk about grooming uh, FinTech talent and what we need to do more in nurturing the ta talent in this space. So John, you're, you're people per person, so. I really think nowadays that the most important way, the most convenient, the most efficient way to do it is through more in-house upskilling. Uh, not instead of a, a lot of firms are looking for outside talent to bring them in to do a new technology related job But I think it's even more important now you you train retrain or up train your own staff uh, Give them giving them more skills new skills so that they can have greater continuity in the in the work that you do so I, I really hope that our organizations in Hong Kong would place a little more importance more resources in upskilling uh, their own staff so, so that we can uh, improve in, in terms of the, the, the skill level of, uh, of the Hong Kong workforce. Yeah, can't agree more. Yeah, Shifa? Um, I, I think this is along the same lines as um, the, the, the previous innovation hub positioning. Um, I, I actually think the most important thing uh, right now uh, to inspire the next generation is to showcase local heroes. Um, you know, show them people that have been through that journey, show them people, you know, what, how they started, what, what you know, skills they had to have, um, you, know, show, you know, show them, you know, failure cases, right? Like why, why it failed, but then how they then made it su successful, right? You, you need to be able to show the younger generation, um, you know, people that have been through it, that have come out the other side, um, and you need to show them people who can be mentors and you know, uh, ha have, a, have a guiding light. So I think that that's still um, you know, the vision, and, and, and that's what we need. Thank you. Colin? Well, certainly, I think talent is a key ingredient for FinTech. And, but the tricky thing is it, it takes time to groom talent. And so we, we actually need both short-term and long-term measures. Uh, for short-term measures, of course, uh, uh, we can, you know, you know, work with universities uh, to to bring up the, the graduates, uh, undergraduates or postgraduate, and actually uh, we have been doing that. And um, we also recently introduced a, a accreditation, you know, kind of regime on fintech. Hopefully, that will help, you know, upskill or reskill, you know, some of the existing financial market participants. But of course, in the long term, uh, we need to to you know get that into the formal education system universities, vocational training, to ensure that we have an ongoing supply of talent to support the long-term you know, uh, development of the fintech landscape. In, in my mind, there are two very important elements that we have to train our next generation. Um, one is being innovative. And innovative is not invention. Innovative is basically come up with uh, new ways of resolving old problems. The second element I think is very important is to build the ability of our younger generation or you know, human mankind, um, empathy. 
because you know I talked about client experience. You know, is the start you know of all the technology solution. So I think you know human beings uh, has to have the ability to understand the perspective you know of the problem. Has to have the ability to understand human mankind before you know we can come up with a technology or digital solution. Um, the, the reason you know. Uh, books that I read, I have uh, read a very great definition of AI, is that AI is actually a quantification of what a human being is thinking. Mm. Um, so it started with what a human being is thinking. So that's why you know, I think empathy is very important. Great, thanks. I think it's going back to a very basic thing, is um, uh, starting with sort of helping the younger generation to develop. And we've been all through that journey. I think it's important that it's, it's, it's our duty to help them, in particular in these very challenging times and, and very different times. Although the, the challenges they're facing are very different from us, but I, I guess that the, 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 at least the, the same important thing is uh, deal with professor reference. And, uh, and, and I think our, our help is important to make the next generation even better than ours. So thank you all the panelists, and can I ask you to join, to give a big hand.